Rick, Rick asked me whether I would be willing to come here and talk about the future of our experiments the way I see it. And of course, you may or may not know that Rick used to be an investment banker. And so I know what he really wanted me to talk about is uh, why you should invest in Xenon, and I'm happy to do uh, just that. While I have your, uh, <laughs> the, the background image is of two people, uh, um, you know, looking sh uh, for coal, looking for dark stuff deep underground, which is uh, essentially what we're doing. Um, and so while I have your attention, um, let me give you the outline of the talk, and that is whenever you see a coal miner like this guy, this is your take home messages. Um, so if you snooze off or whatever, or you lose, or I lose touch base with you, uh, just wait till you see one of those guys. They will tell you what you just missed and what the take home messages are, and you can come back in the talk and we'll take it on from there. So again, while I have your uh, uh, attention, let me conclude with a spoiler alert. Um, we, we do know that dark matter exists, but we have no freaking clue what it's made out of. Um, but the nice thing, and that's really the bottom line of my talk, is that xenon-based par experiments in particular are both probing our most popular models and at the same time are sensitive to really a large array of signals from dark matter, neutrinos, and other things, um, as I will show you. Uh, and, and that itself is essentially the reason why xenon is a great project to, to be on, or also LZ, of course, that some of you um, here work on, are great projects to work on with, I think, a shining future in front of them. Okay, so let's dive in. What I want to do is, uh, and I promised that in the abstract, is I want to give you a very um, big picture overview about why we know that dark matter exists from all kinds of observations. I'll go through at least half a dozen different points, and the thing here is not to make you really understand all the details of the pieces of evidence that we have for dark matter, but to give you a broad overview of you know, how this fits all together. And so let's start with cosmological arguments um, and uh, let's start at just shortly after the Big Bang, you get for, you know, or your orientation, you can look at the top right, it tells you the scale is the entire cosmos, but we are looking at three minutes after the Big Bang, which is the time of Big Bang nuclear synthesis. What happens is that you essentially take all neutrons that you have at the time and you gobble them up in helium-4. That's the main process and the prediction from Big Bang that comes from that is 25% of the uh, universe is made out of helium and that um, prediction just comes out perfectly right, right? The rest is hydrogen and all the other rest is completely negligible. Well, we can look at higher order effects and you see that on the plot we are going on a, a, by the abundance, we are reducing by many, many orders of magnitude. We can look at deuterium. Um, deuterium is a step on the way to fuse protons and neutrons into helium-4. And so the higher the density in the early universe, the more deuterium will be fused into helium-4. In other words, you can use the measurement, so you see from, from theory, the denser the early universe in baryons, meaning protons and neutrons, um, the less deuterium you should be left out with because more of it can fuse in helium-4. So you can now turn to your astronomy friends and ask for a measurement of the earliest deuterium abundance that you can have. And what you find is that actually this tells you that the uh, density of baryons in the early universe at three minutes after the Big Bang is only around 5%. A similar measurement holds true for helium-3 and there's uh, something funky going on with lithium-7. But basically this gives you a consistent picture already three minutes after the Big Bang that we're really missing out on something big, mainly that we don't understand uh, 97 percent of the energy density in the universe. Okay, so dark matter is really something new. It's not baryons, it's not heavy elements, but it's something, you know, brand new. Uh, let's fast forward to 370,000 years after the Big Bang, the emission of the cosmic microwave background. You have seen the right picture, uh, which is a zoom in on the tiny, tiny temperature fluctuations that we see there. Um, this is at the time when uh, the universe just cooled enough for uh, atoms to form, for the plasma to become transparent. If you want to uh, analyze that pretty picture, what you would do is you would do, well, something like a Fourier transform, except here you are not in time space, but you are in 2D space. So you do a deconvolution into spherical harmonics. Doesn't matter. Point being, you get what is shown on the left. This is a power spectrum. We're all physicists here, I take it. So if you look at that, immediately you recognize what is happening here is you have some oscillator that is damped, right? Um, and so, okay, what is oscillating? Well, in the early universe, uh, these are called baryon acoustic oscillations. Really what is happening is on the one hand, you have gravity that likes to cluster stuff together. And on the other hand, you have uh, photons that try to push stuff apart. So you have two forces that are opposing each other. Whenever you have that, uh, you know, you get oscillations. Um, the damping comes from the photon pressure. And if you look at this damping curve, you see that something is wrong. In particular, just, you know, just without going in details, which probably is two weeks in a cosmology class, um, you see that the third peak that you have there, it's, it's not damped, it's too strong. 
the third peak in this power spectrum doesn't participate in the stamping, what this tells you immediately is that there has to be some component in the early universe that part doesn't participate in the damping, some component that doesn't interact with photons, which are responsible for the stamping. And so this tells you that, well, by now we know that already, that there has to be dark matter in the universe. Um, what you can do is you can fit that, and so this gives you then a quantitative uh, measurement that tells you that dark matter is about five times more than normal matter, and because it doesn't participate in the photon damping, this tells you that dark matter doesn't interact electromagnetically. Okay, from those tiny small fluctuations that you see on the right plot, they are at the level of 10 to the minus four. Fast forwarding to today, only a few billion years later, um, you have to grow all these incredible density fluctuations that we observe, right? Remember, here on Earth, we're in a very peculiar space. If you, you just go a few miles up, you're in the vacuum of space. So how do you explain from this extremely homogeneous early universe, this is extremely non-homogeneous universe that we observe today? This is a science of structure formation. You take, propagate those fluctuations forward. Um, and uh, essentially what you get from that is uh, um, uh, the, the notion that you need to have something that likes to cluster and clump a lot really, really, really fast to explain why our universe is so clustered as we have it. And so um, again, you know that there has to be much more matter in the form of some new form, uh, namely dark matter, than we observe with baryons. But something that you learn also is this dark matter has to want to cluster, meaning it has to be non-relativistic. If it would be a relativistic fluid, it would tend to uh, wash uh, structure out, but actually dark matter wants to clump. You see that on the right two plots, our universe looks like the bottom uh, one, not like the top one. And so again, we learned something from dark matter about this. So to summarize here, uh, in case I already lost you, here's your coal miner giving you the summary, always wear a helmet. Dark matter exists at all times. And so we learned from cosmology that dark matter is stable. It's non-baryonic, it has to be transparent. So yes, actually dark matter is a complete misnomer, right? It should be called transparent matter because it's actually not dark. But then, of course, dark matter sounds so much cooler, right? So we, 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 we keep the name. It uh, has to be non-relativistic. OK, let's move on from cosmological observations to astrophysical observations. I start with the largest objects, uh, largest bound objects that we have. That's uh, galaxy clusters. This picture is from the Coma cluster, where you can just look at it. Everything that's blue is a galaxy in this cluster. And we see something like 10 to the 14 solar masses uh, in this cluster in baryons. But then um, if you just look at the speeds of how fast those galaxies are moving around, they are actually moving around a lot. And so this tells you that your gravitational potential well has to be very deep to sustain those high speeds. So from that you learn that if from because of virilization is what is behind that, um, you actually require some 10 to the 15 solar masses. So again, we see here an astrophysical system that is dominated by dark matter. A similar study you can do if you look at uh, gravitational lensing, this particular picture here that I drew uh, is from Abel 2218, where you look at those arcs, this is strong gravitational lensing, and you can tell by looking at them and the way we understand gravity that in this cluster that you see, there have to be some 10 to the 13 solar masses, uh, sorry, you, um, the, you observe some 10 to the 13 solar masses shining at you, but you know from the strength of the gravitational lenses that uh, really um, the total mass needs to be an order of magnitude larger. So again, you have another measurement that shows you that gravitational lenses, um, you have another measurement that uh, galaxy clusters too uh, really contain a lot of dark matter. There's one particular measure, so dark matter dominates is what we learned from that. There's a particular measurement or class of measurements in galaxy clusters that's quite interesting from which we can learn something else about dark matter and this is merging galaxy clusters. Mm -hmm. uh, here's a picture of that. Uh, this particular picture is from what is called the bullet cluster. Um, Really, this is not just one cluster, but this is two clusters. And you can kind of see that if you squint a little bit, um, there is the largest one here on the left and a much smaller one here on the right. Now, if you ask uh, your uh, astronomy friends, they will tell you that most in the mass in those galaxy clusters is actually not shining at you in the, in the form of galaxies and stars that you can see in optical, but most of the baryonic mass is actually shining in hot intracluster gas in, in terms of x-rays. So you take the Chandra satellite, take an image of that thing, and what you find is that uh, um, this intracluster gas, which is dominating the most of the baryons, is shining here. And now you can also see what gives the cluster this name. This is this bullet shape, this bow shock front that you have here. What happened here at some point is the past, there were really two clusters that went through each other. They passed through each other. The smaller cluster, which is now on the right side, used to be on the left side, uh, got shocked in the process and uh, you see the shock front still today. Um, okay, so I have this uh, bit sketched out here on the left side. So we have those components, right? The galaxies and the gas are being, uh, going through each other. Well, you can ask where is most of the mass in this cluster? And the way you would do that if you just want to measure mass is you go to gravitational lensing. 
you can do a gravitational uh, microlensing study on this, and what you get is this contour map that looks like this, which tells you that actually most of the gravitational mass in this cluster is not where most of the baryons are, but it's offset. It's offset to be further apart. And so what you learn from this is about the bullet, from the bullet cluster and other cluster, merging clusters like these, is that actually in the past when the dark matter went through each other, uh, or through itself, when it passed itself, the dark matter did not get slowed down as the normal matter did, due to some kind of friction, but it just kept going, um, just like the stars did, right? You see the, the dark matter is distributed like the stars are, but it's not slowed down like the, um, uh, most of the baryons are. So what this tells you is that dark matter is essentially collisionless, just like those point-like galaxies would be, uh, and you can derive an upper limit on the cross-section of dark matter. And so what you learn from that is that dark matter has, um, other than gravitational interactions, at most weak interactions. It doesn't seem to be interacting a whole lot with each other. Let's zoom further in and let's go to smaller uh, structures that we have. In particular, of course, the standard model that you probably know is rotation curves of galaxies. I put this at the end because it's really just one piece of, uh, one piece of the puzzle out of many, as I tried to show you to right now. Here's an example um, from a, a um, uh, uh, M31, uh, 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 a galaxy in the local group. It's just because it's nice, big, and you can get pretty pictures. Um, so I drew that here from DSS. Um, what you can do is you can look at the rotation curves of how fast are the, gal the stars are going around this galaxy as function of the distance. And of course, what you would expect if you, you know, you just equilibrate um, a centripetal force with uh, uh, the uh, mass inside, you get this. Uh, um, very simple relationship here, which tells you Kepler's law. Uh, if you're far out, right, you know the mass can be approximated at the point mass of the origin, um, and so uh, your rotational velocity that you would expect goes like one over the square root of the radius, Kepler's law. And this is if you do it properly, and you don't just do it so hand-wavingly, but you do the, take the actual disk distribution. The dash, dashed line is what you would expect for how fast gas and uh, stars should go around this galactic center. Now you can make a measurement just using Doppler shifts, and this is what you find. Whoops. That's very, very different. Uh, it's not a small effect, it's a whoppingly big effect. Uh, it's not just this galaxy, but it's actually any galaxy that we look at are rotating way too quickly. It's become known as the um, problem of flat rotation curves. Um, how do you fit that? Well, the simplest case is if you did Astro 101, you learned, uh, you learned the simplest model for a star is a self-gravitating blob of gas, which gives you an isothermal halo, meaning just something that has the same temperature anywhere. The mass profile of an isothermal halo goes like uh, the radius, and if you plug that in here, then this cancels and the rotational velocity becomes constant. So uh, what we learned from this is that we should expect dark matter to be distributed in this galaxy or any other galaxy for that matter to be distributed in something that is roughly an isothermal halo to reproduce the flat rotation curves. Um, if you wonder how this looks in our own Milky Way, this is the example. You are here at eight and a half kiloparsec from the center, and you see our rotation curve is flat as well. And we actually can look at, again, how much stars and dust and other stuff do we see, how much baryons do we see, how much can we attribute to that, and how much is needed for dark matter. And from that measurement, we make a measurement that in this room right here where we are right now, there is a density of dark matter of about a third of a proton mass, 0.3 GeV per cubic centimeter. That maybe doesn't sound uh, like a lot, but again, you need to realize that here on Earth, we're in a very specific, special place. Once you integrate that over the galaxy, it becomes a lot. So this is great for what I'm going to talk about in the rest of my talk, This means that because that means that we can search for dark matter, astrophysical dark matter, without having to leave Earth. We can search for it here on Earth. Okay, so the coal miner, uh, so, so dark matter is right here, is what we learn here, and your take home message is dark matter exists not only at all time scales, we know that from cosmology, but from astrophysics, we also know that it exists at all length scales, and in particular, we know that there's about 0.3 GeV per cubic centimeter in this room. Great. So with that, I hope that I could convince you that dark matter does exist. That's all I have. If I couldn't convince you now, then let's discuss it. But, um, Let's take this and let's ask the questions that we have in particle physics. Okay, great. What is, part of, what is dark matter made out of? What would be the dark matter quantum? Arguably, the most important parameter for any particle is its mass, and so we need to look at the allowed mass uh, range. Um, uh, and this is it. Uh, you have some, the allowed mass range is uh, only 90 <laughs> orders of magnitude. Um, we know for sure, this is completely model independent, we know for sure that dark matter has to be the dark matter quanta have to be more heavy than 10 to the minus 21 electron volts, because at that mass, the Compton wavelength, or the Broglie wavelength of the particles would be larger than dwarf galaxies. 
it's a bit silly, but you know. Anyway, we know dwarf galaxies do contain dark matter, so the, the quantum has to be more massive than that. Uh, at the heavy end, we can argue a little bit where that precise uh, limit is. Is that some, some, something like uh, 10 solar masses or more or less, whatever, um, where uh, you would say it's excluded above that because of gravitational lensing or some of the studies that you did here, stability of uh, dwarf galaxy halos or cosmic microwave background constraints. Um, and so these are the 90 orders of magnitude, and now what you are left to do is you ask, you're left to ask the question, uh, where's Waldo? <laughs> right? And um, as an experimentalist, this is the question you have to ask. There is no way around this. What you have to do is you, ha you have to find your very own private personal prior in a Bayesian language of where you think dark matter is, and only if you have that prior can you start to build an experiment to test that prior and to integrate that prior out and probe as large as much of that prior as you can. So naturally then what people have done is they have filled that with priors. Uh, one thing to realize is that there are two uh, interesting uh, masses in particular. One is the electron volt range. Um, if the mass of the particle is le uh, lighter than an electron volt, the phase space density becomes so high that the particles start to overlap so you know you have a boson. It's the ether all over again. Um, so below that mass it has to be bosonic, above that mass it can also be fermionic. And that only goes up to the Planck mass or so there about, which is at 10 to the 18 GeV, uh, where above that you know, we know you have new physics, it's probably not, doesn't make sense to call it a particle, you would call it a composite. <coughs> and so then what you do is you fill this mass range with priors. Uh, some uh, priors that you will have heard of are axions, which I'm actually not talking a whole lot uh, about, or WIMPs, weakly interacting massive particles. Well, again, I have the spoiler all right, uh, all alert already out there. We haven't found dark matter yet, and so since those priors have been tested quite a bit already, although we are far from done yet, um, what people do these days, what's happening is that we're opening up our priors and we're starting to look left and right. Particular people uh, say, okay, maybe it's just axion-like, opening up the mass range here, or maybe it's just a thermal relic, I'll tell you about that, uh, uh, opening up the parameter space. And there's other ideas that you could look for. Primordial black holes are essentially ruled out. Uh, sterile neutrinos are kind of interesting. Uh, and, and a long list, and this is by no means complete, it's complete, it's just about supposed to give you a picture. Um, Good news here is also that uh, most of this parameter space, or a lot of it at least, is actually covered by experiment or uh, newly proposed experiments, so experiments that are running a long time. The green ones there um, that I have up there are all using liquid xenon, and you see there's a lot of them, and there's a good reason for that that I'll tell you about that, and also that I'm, um, why, why this is, um, yeah, uh, is, is essentially what the rest of the talk is. So the take home message from the coal miner is uh, great. Uh, there's finite parameter space. There's only 90 orders magnitude to height, so, uh, let, let's start. Um, one particular uh, model that I want to tell you about is that of a thermal relic particle uh, because it is from an experimental point of view extremely predictive and, uh, and very elegant uh, and a good target to look for. It's a good prior to half. The idea there is that this particle, the one idea that you put in is that this particle would have been at some point in the early universe uh, in thermal equilibrium with the rest of the, of the universe. Um, like any particle that we know, um, doesn't have to be, but that's the assumption that you put in. If that's the case, let me talk you through it, and you look at the, um, uh, so what we're plotting here is the co-moving number density, meaning you know, the number density, but I divide the expansion of the universe out. I don't want to you know, deal with that. So co-moving number density. Uh, what that means is as the time goes on, the universe, um, the, those particles constantly annihilate into standard model particles. Uh, but then those lighter standard model particles also constantly produce those heavier dark matter particles. Well, that doesn't go on forever because at some point the, the temperature of the universe drops. And so while you can still annihilate your particles, at some point your uh, lighter standard model particles don't have enough energy anymore to produce those heavier dark matter particles. So your density is Boltzmann suppressed. That process doesn't go on forever. At some point, your density becomes so diluted that um, the dark matter particles cannot find each other anymore and annihilation stops and you're left with what is called a relic density. The cool thing about that is the higher the annihilation density, this is thermally averaged annihilation density, the longer you will continue to annihilate and the lower your relic density. And so you get from purely cosmological arguments that has nothing to do with particle physics whatsoever, you get for a thermal relic the density that you end up with going like one over the cross section with some constant in there. And now, of course, if you want to do uh, particle physics, you could say, well, what if I have a mass that is typical of the weak scale and uh, cross sections that are typical of weak scale? It actually turns out that the density comes out to about 10%. Uh, and uh, that's what's called a, a weakly interacting massive particle. So it's a specific item out of a larger class of thermal relic particles. 
Why these models are really, really good is because for experiments like the ones that I do, they give a robust scattering pro uh, uh, prediction. Let's just do a dimensional argument of the rate that I'm going to see in my detector. It's going to be proportional to the cross-section of the process times the flux of the particles. But the flux of the particles is going to be proportional to the density of the particles. Again, it's a, it's a dimensional argument. And so that just comes out to, uh, what do I have here? Density goes like, um, uh, right, the density here uh, times the velocity of the particles. But the density I found goes like 1 over sigma v. So in a dimensional argument, those things cancel. And what this means in reality is that your predictions for war, where thermal relics are is known to within a you know, constant, to within a few orders of magnitude in parameter space, which is great, right? It means you really know what to shoot for, and you also know when you can stop. Good. Um, what you then do if you say you want to search for WIMPs or thermal relics in more pre uh, precisely, how do you present your results? How do you, how do you think about this problem? Well, you plot this most important parameter, which is the mass of your particle here, in a, uh, versus the cross-section of your scattering process. Because we don't really know what we're doing, we put this on a log-log plot, right? And so on this log-log plot, um, you can now fill in your own prior. That's what you have to do. Um, which prior you pick is up to you, but uh, this particular one is uh, whatever, 20-year-old uh, MSSM prior. You can say, well, what if dark matter uh, interacts uh, with a Z boson that has at a tree level that has been ruled out, but it could um, be a C boson interaction through a box diagram that's still allowed. Or you could say, well, what if dark matter interacts, you know, it, we, where do particles get their mass from? That's from the Higgs boson. Well, what if dark matter gets its mass from the Higgs boson and you interact through the Higgs boson? Then again, it looks similar than that. Or you can say, well, you know, what if it is actually C mediation at tree level, but an, at, a, at a dark matter abundance of only a tiny fraction of 10 to the minus 10? Of course, that's the same thing. So you get in this region, and now what you have to ask is, well, where, where are we today and how do we probe that parameter space? So, how do you go searching for those particles? Wimp direct detection 101, everything you need to know on one slide. Um, first thing to realize is that the, the wavelength of those particles, um, if you just plug the numbers in, you know, h bar over p, that's uh, 200 MeV femtometers. The mass, put in whatever you like, say 100 GeV, right, 100 proton masses, and velocities in the galaxy are non-relativistic, comes out to be femtometers, which is the size of a nucleus. Meaning the, the individual particle will not be able to resolve the individual protons and neutrons in your nucleus, but it will have to scatter coherently with all of them. And so what this tells you is that your cross-section doesn't just go grow with the number of targets, but it goes with the number of targets squared, right? You get this coherent enhancement, first sum up and then squared, uh, welcome to quantum mechanics, um, which prefers for a detector a high mass number, so something in the periodic table at the bottom of the periodic table, such as xenon. Um, or if you want to couple to the spin, it would couple to the quantum mechanical spin, uh, square of the spin. Um, OK, th that's good. But here's the problem. If you look at the uh, energy that you have available, the recoil spectrum in particular, um, if you calculate the maximum transferable recoil energy that I can get if this particle comes from the galactic halo and it just bumps off my detector, just p squared over 2m, you plug in some numbers. Again, 100 GeV, non-relativistic speeds, you know, a target of Xenon 136 proton masses, comes out to 50 G keV, 50 kilo electron volts, that's small energy. So for particle physics, that is really the challenge. And to make it worse, it's actually, that's the maximum endpoint energy, which in reality you, you'd never reach for various effects. Nevertheless, um, we, we have built experiments that can do that. I'll show you an example. And so in this parameter space where you have your prior, um, we have, again, spoiler alert, we haven't found it yet, right? Um, so uh, based on the fact that we didn't see it, I can say it, uh, dark matter has to be below that blue line, and I can rule out this light blue colored region, because otherwise I would have seen it in my detector. Um, uh, three comments to that. Uh, the best limits all come from liquid xenon experiments. That's not a coincidence. Um, at low masses, you lose sensitivity because uh, the, the dark matter particle becomes so light that it can no longer kick your xenon nucleus above your energy threshold. And at high masses, uh, the, um, uh, you know, the mass density is fixed, 2.3 GeV per cubic centimeter from, from the rotation curve. But as you go increase the mass of the particle, that means the number density goes down. And so you just become less sensitive because there's less particles in that region. And so that's why you get this one over mass slope uh, over there. Um, OK, so we haven't found anything. And so the natural thing to do is to try to push this uh, down uh, left and right. Uh, and so we go back to the funding agencies and ask for more money. And that's what we do. Um, so take home message, uh, thermal relics are really good because they have a predictive target to within a few orders of magnitude. Um, the cross section actually is, is known. Um, you can have various uh, very generic ways of coupling through that. Uh, Higgs mediation, see through a box, or if you want to have SUSE, you can do that as well. Um, and maybe most importantly, the experiments that we do today actually do probe 
this parameter space, which is a non-trivial statement, right? It's not obvious that if you make an experiment, you actually probe where you would expect dark matter to be. So that's really good. Um, okay, at that point, I'm halfway through my talk, so it's time for a few pictures to relax a little bit. Uh, let me show you a, a picture book from the experiment that I'm working on. It's not in the US, but you go to Italy. Uh, you drive from Rome um, uh, to the Adriatic Sea to take a swim there, and on the way, you need to pass through the Gran Sasso mountain range. There is a tunnel, highway tunnel that's actually 10 kilometers long, and you drive in that tunnel for quite a while. Right, 10 kilometers, takes a while, it's a highway, it's in Italy, you can drive fast, but still it takes a while. And then in the middle of the mountain, there's actually an exit. Yes, you take the exit, you stand in front of a huge stainless steel gate, you push, a, um, push the bell and say the magic works, and then it's like, it's totally like in a James Bond movie, you know, the stainless steel gate opens and you drive into what is the largest underground, well, used to be, uh, well, it's one of the largest underground laboratories in the world, this is what it looks like just the at, at the entrance. In this underground laboratory, there are three gigantic uh, halls. This is a picture of one of them. You see the roof of that. Um, up here, you see a few people for size comparison. What we did is we built a three-story building in that underground hall, just a household infrastructure um, that's here for the, um, for the experiment from liquid xenon storage, data acquisition, and cryogenics. And then the experiment itself is located in a 10 by 10 meter water tank. A graduate student in my group put up a poster that if you stood here would tell you what it would look like if you could look like inside. So the detector itself sits in the center. We go underground and we do all these things because background is really the game, name of the game. We need to reduce our backgrounds. The actual experiment is about a meter by a meter. Uh, we have two areas of photomultipliers, three inch. So for the LZ people, it's exactly the same than what you're building, putting together right now. Um, here's a, a detail. You can actually see the cathode wires here. We also have an electric field, uh, two photomultiplier arrays. Um, you put all this together. Uh, wrap it up uh, in uh, Christmas foil, put it in the water tank, fill up the water, and uh, take data. Um, I cannot do without explaining you how this experiment works. It's a time projection chamber. Um, it's actually fairly simple. You have those two areas of photomultipliers, one at the bottom, one at the top. Any particle comes in, uh, gives a, uh, interacts with your xenon, kicks an electron or a xenon that produces ionization, which is, as it recombines, gives you a flash this is on a, what you see on oscilloscope, a flash of light, um, and we call that the S1 signal because it's the first signal that we see. At the same time, there's electrons that are liberated in the interaction. We drift those up relatively slowly. The detector is quite slow. Um, so again, another reason you want to have low background. And then up there, um, with a, a strong electric field, we extract that into the gas phase, create a second pulse through proportional scintillation that we call S2. Why do we do that is because from the hit pattern on the top PMT array, you can say this is where the event happened. It didn't happen over here because this PMT saw, saw most of the light. So this gives us XY position reconstruction. And from the time difference between this initial flash of light and this ionization peak, we get the Z position. So we can, in 3D, we can uh, have vertex reconstruction. This is XY, this is uh, C versus this radius squared, so polar coordinates, cylindrical coordinates here. This is a view from the top. And you see most of the background actually um, gets stuck at the surface. You reduce, in particular at low energies, your background radioactivity by some four or five orders of magnitude, um, which is really great. Not only that, but in addition, we can also tell from those two signals what kind of interaction we have had. If there's a particle that comes and scatters off the electrons, um, then we get a, what is called an electronic recoil. Those tend to fall along the yellow line um, in this parameter space where we plot um, the ionization signal versus the scintillation signal. Whereas if you have something more heavy, you would tend to that to scatter off your nucleus. Uh, so dark matter, WIMPs in particular, you would get a nuclear recoil and you see those follow along the blue line. Um, and so. Uh, we can even distangle, distinguish what kind of recall we had in the detector. But really the secret of success, and we had some of discussion of that earlier, um, of why I think it's always, it's all those detectors really that are so good in the search and why we left the competition behind. It's because we have redundant event information, I think. Um, and this allows us, you know, all those detectors are prototypes. You build them once, you put them together in your garage or here in, in actually in the basement here at, at Brown. Um, and of course, you know, some things work and some other things don't work. And so really where this or, or stuff happens that you didn't think about when you built the experiment. So um, what this redundancy helps you is to fight detector artifacts um, in, in pushing the sensitivity further. So uh, the take home message is that liquid xenon TPCs are great. They are monolithic scalable. They are really, really cheap. Tens of millions of dollars per project. It's really not a whole lot of money. They have redundant event from information. And as I'll show you through the rest of talk, um, my talk, they are really versatile science machines which is great um, uh, to, to keep you motivated. Okay, we took data with the Xenon one ton experiment, the one I just showed you. Uh, we did a blind analysis. This is really just for Rick, but we talked about that, so I don't need to go into details here. Um, we, we looked at the events. We saw a few events, but we did a 4D likelihood, so the computer can 
you know, in lots of parameters, uh, uh, find out where, what the events are. To plot it, it's horribly complicated, so we have those pie charts which you can identify. So this event is that event in another parameter space. Here's the x, y, and z, r squared. Long story short, we searched for dark matter for a year with this experiment. We didn't find anything, and so we placed the limit. Um, that's just, again, to say that uh, the, the data that we have is perfectly consistent with our expectation. So if you don't find dark matter, what do you do? Well, naturally, you go to the funding agency and you say, let's give me more money to build a bigger one, right? Um, and so uh, with uh, Xenon, what we do is we upgrade uh, to uh, what we call Xenon Anton, because when we just proposed it, we didn't know how, to, how big we would make it. We actually still don't know. Um, we shut down Xenon Anton this year. We reuse a lot of the infrastructure that allows us to go rather fast, so we hope um, to upgrade to more than eight tons total, six tons active in the TPC, and more than four tons with usual volume um, with a start date, hopefully at around this time next year. I would be amiss if I wouldn't mention that, of course, uh, and you have the, the, one of the leading groups here in this house. Um, there is uh, another experiment, uh, which is LZ at SURF, not at Gran Sasso, which is essentially the same technology, which some technical differences that we can discuss offline, um, which is a bit bigger, um, but on a very similar time scale, we'll, you know, it's a head-to-head -head race to see who, who finishes first um, to build this experiment. So what we can do with those is we, can, uh, we expect to be able to improve our sensitivity of where we are right now by some two orders of magnitude going further down. And the take home message that you have here is that we haven't seen a signal, but we have a strong program to plow ahead and probe two orders of magnitude further into this uh, thermal relic, WIMP, Higgs mediated, whatever you like, prior. The science reach of those experiments is really rich. These are not just dark matter experiments. This is about the, the, the channels that I have, and I want to point out a few of those. Um, to you. Um, of course, there's lots of dark matter channels, including, and we had some discussion about that earlier this morning, going up to Planck masses. Uh, we can make statements about dark photons, axions, if you're interested in that. But we are actually a sensitive neutrino detector. At which point you should go like, what, Raphael? No, it can't be, right? There's no way that we can do neutrinos. Neutrino detectors are something like Borexino, where you can walk around inside 280 tons, Super K, where you take a boat to drive in your detector fly, uh, around our ice cube, right? A cubic kilometer of ice. That's neutrino experiments. How can I compete with that with my tiny, weeny, bitty uh, detector? Well, the answer is neutrinos, just like dark matter, can coherently scatter, if you, and if you are, have a low enough energy threshold, you can become sensitive to that. And so what happens is that you get an enhancement of the cross-section by two orders of magnitude, meaning with a two orders of magnitude smaller detector, you're still in game, and that's exactly what we do here. So what can we do with this uh, signal, this coherent elastic neutrino nuclear scattering, again, the same effect than with dark matter when the transferred momentum is so large that you can't resolve individual nuclei, um, has just last year been discovered at the spallation neutron source by the coherent collaboration. They were using low energy, low background uh, cesium scintillators, cesium iodine scintillators, and you can see they had a pulsed beam, so beam off, there wouldn't be any signal at low energies here, number of photoelectrons, whereas if the beam was on, they would see a signal quite clearly there. So this has just been discovered. At the same time, this is really a very hot uh, topic where a lot is happening right now. And uh, already now, if they aware a galactic, a, a supernova blowing off anywhere, going off a, in, the, in the Milky Way galaxy, already our xenon one ton experiment right now would be sensitive to this. This is what the, these experiments show here, and we could do uh, contribute an additional, in this case, flavor-independent channel to supernova neutrino physics, which would be quite cool, would be a measurement of the total calorimetric energy that went into neutrinos because we are coherent scattering is flavor insensitive. So that's already a reality. This channel already exists. We are just sitting there and waiting for uh, uh, supernova to go off. Um, Perhaps more interestingly, going forward uh, into the future, um, what you can do is you can say, well, okay, so, so really those experiments do simple kinematics. It's just scattering, right? Billiard ball scattering. And so as you know from Physics 101, that is degenerate in momentum. You actually don't know whether you're scattering a heavy wimp that is non-relativistic, and that's what we assume here for the blue or the yellow curve, or you can get an undiscriminable, distinguishable signal um, if you have a light neutrino, that conversely is very fast. As long as the transferred momentum is the same, it'll look at the same in your detector. And so people can, uh, what you can do is uh, you can put neutrino signals on the same plot um, because you know, it's, the, it's the dark matter equivalent spectrum that you would get from that neutrino signal. In particular, two ones um, that I want to point out. Um, 
uh, if you see where we are, what you find is that here is a signal at, uh, that is equivalent to low wind masses, which comes from solar boron-8 neutrinos that both xenon anton and LZ uh, will be sensitive to, and we will measure that in the early 2020s after a few years day of data. From uh, your very own LZ calibration comes this uh, beautiful simulation here, where again you find the background follows the yellow line. Um, dark matter you would expect around this blue line. This is again the parameter space of ionization versus scintillation. And uh, you can count uh, after, you know, this is about three years of data taking. Um, so that's why I put 2023 there or thereabout. Um, you would expect tens of solar boron eight neutrinos, um, the green stuff uh, at the bottom there that you could see. So that's quite exciting. Uh, allows you to do solar neutrino physics, maybe inform uh, the solar metallicity problem. Um, in, in our field, people talk about this. This is more for the particle physicists uh, in, the, in the audience, about the neutrino floor and that we are going to hit the neutrino floor very soon. I would call uh, the atmospheric neutrinos really down here as the neutrino floor. And what you can see is that as of today, we are three orders of magnitude away from that. And even the program that we have currently funded is still an order of magnitude short of that neutrino floor. And so what this is telling you is that um, actually, with the currently funded program, there is a gap there where we have some very well motivated parameter space from this dark matter WIMPs um, that isn't covered by the current program um, the, and, and requires really a yet larger detector. So there is this very strong motivation to fill this WIMP gap with a larger detector. So we call it, I will call it a generation three experiment to start after LZ and Xenon and Anton are done in maybe 2026 or thereabout with the goal to really probe WIMPs down to the atmospheric neutrino background, which is to say that you're building a dark matter detector where the specs are really defined by measuring a neutrino signal. It's kind of fun that it's not dark matter that sets the scale, but it's the neutrinos that sets the scale. Um, the project already has at least 8 millions of euros. Your, uh, Europeans are a little bit ahead of us on that, of R&D funding, but we have uh, collaborations in place and expressions of interest to work on that. Um, detector essentially could be a scale up of what we have now. Uh, when it comes to the title of my talk, and that is why you should invest in xenon, is because uh, to build this experiment, you need something like 50, 60 tons of xenon, which corresponds to about one world year production. Um, and so we think we know how we can do that, and that is essentially just you buy it over a long time. We have uh, a decade, right, to, to get the xenon together. But I think there's a very good case to do that. Xenon comes out of the air and is produced in those big uh, liquefaction plants that you can see a picture of one of those plants there. Um, what you would do with that is you would, uh, where is the boron-8 signal? from solar neutrinos uh, would be very much at the bottom left in this parameter space. You would get a much larger signal of about one and a half events uh, from 50 tons. This is again the LZ uh, simulation following design criteria. What the nice thing about that is you can measure atmospheric neutrinos, the atmospheric neutrino cosmic ray background at MeV energies where no other measurement exists and do physics with that. So that's pretty cool. Take home message with, uh, from coherent elastic neutrino nuclear scattering. Um, we are already now through this channel sensitive to a galactic supernova with our experiments. At the same time, uh, we are uh, expecting to be able to measure uh, solar boron-8 uh, neutrinos through this uh, flavor independent channel. Um, but for an to really measure atmospheric neutrinos at MEV energies, we need a bigger detector and, uh, and are working on that. Okay. This is dark matter. This is coherent neutrino scattering. What else? can we do about with those detectors? Why are they so cool? Why am I so excited about that? Well, let's look at the background spectrum from xenon one ton. Uh, this is as function of the logarithm of the energy is a log log plot, be aware of that. Um, first thing that I wanna point out is that uh, the, the most of our, well, a lot of our background rate actually comes from this red process here, which is the two neutrino double beta decay from xenon 136 overall is quite a contribution. That's crazy when you think about it that you realize that this thing has such a long half-life that it hadn't been even measured at all as little as, what, six years ago or something before the exo calibration measured it. Um, at low energies, radon is a technological challenge. If, and if you want to know what the consequences of that is, just visit Rick's lab. Um, uh, but uh, actually something interesting is happening here that's just an order of magnitude below where we are right now. Um, we are already sensitive to electronic recoils from PP solar neutrinos. PP solar neutrinos is the main energy producing cycle in the sun. And if they scatter off electrons, um, we actually already have now a background contribution from that. So that will become much better as we go ahead. And what we could do with that with a generation three experiment with more exposure, um, you could expect to make a measurement of, in this case, this is the neutrino survival probability coming from the sun. You know the solar uh, neutrino problem, only half or so come arrive here uh, at energies where uh, no other experiment is sensitive with very, very, very small energy bar, uh, possibly measure the Weinberg angle or you know, uh, refine solar models um, that we could do with an experiment like that. 
Here's another thing if you're interested in neutrinos or nuclear physics. Uh, there's uh, the inverse of, uh, neutrino stuff or of, of neutrino double beta decay. Two neutrino double beta decay is essentially the inverse process is double two neutrino double electron capture, where you capture two K-shell electrons in the nucleus at the same time. It's an incredibly rare process uh, that can happen on xenon-124 here. Um, xenon-124 is an abundance that is only 0.1%, so that's not a whole lot, but you know, we have a lot of it and we expose it for a lot. The XMAS collaboration in Japan has searched uh, in their data and they found, uh, this is what their data looked like. You see, you would expect a bump at uh, twice the energy of a K-shell electron in xenon-124, so 60 some keV. Um, unfortunately, they have a background in their experiment from iodine-125, and so the, the plot that you see there, their best fit does have the blue thing, a um, hint of a signal in there, um, but uh, they do not make a claim because, they, because it's very hard for them, the energy resolution is not so good, to distinguish that from the background from iodine-125, and so they just place a limit here, which is interesting on the half-life. What you see is that there's different theoretical predictions of what the half-life of this decay would be. Not only is this the longest half-life of any decay that would be measured if you measure it, but also measuring it would help you to distinguish which of those uh, theoretical models are right, which in turn helps you to define the nuclear matrix elements that you need for the two neutrino, sorry, the uh, neutrino less double beta decay search in xenon. Um, what can we do with the xenon one ton experiment? We actually uh, had from the very beginning this uh, same energy region blinded for exactly this reason, do not disturb ourselves, but we do have a better energy resolution. We have uh, longer exposure and uh, we have a getter, most importantly, that removes through constant recirculation um, this cosmically, cosmogenic activation of iodine 125 or neutron activation. Um, and so uh, our sensitivity is actually larger than what XMAS placed as a limit. So if this blue stuff, if this hint of a signal in XMAS is true, we should be able to see it. And what I'm allowed to say is uh, stay tuned uh, for that result. So I think that's also quite exciting. Um, there's not only double electron capture, but if you do that, you say, let's go full out. Why not use that uh, for two neutrino, for um, neutrinoless double beta decay experiment, in particular on xenon 136. Uh, there are dedicated experiments that do that by enriching the xenon. We don't need to do that because actually xenon 136 has an abundance of about 10%, 9%. And so you could consider that you can use a generation three experiment with a natural abundance, which saves a tremendous amount of mon money, millions of dollars, to just use that experiment that you have already anyway for dark matter to search for a neutrino double beta decay with a potential quite a range that uh, with, depending on where your background is exactly, um, might probe uh, sizable uh, 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 fractions of the inverted hierarchy parameter space. Um, that's if you have a, a normal natural abundance uh, 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 in your target. Uh, alternatively, you can say, well, I actually enrich my xenon and I give the xenon 136 to the NXO collaboration and I let them do this channel, at which point we would naturally have a depleted xenon target, which would be great because I'm happy about that too, because then what we could do is we could look for elastic scattering on a depleted target where xenon 136 hertz to make a measurement of, Z of CNO solo neutrinos. The CNO cycle is again one of those things. These neutrinos have not yet been measured and being, uh, of course, providing the first measurement of that would be uh, quite a feat. Um, for which, however, we would need a depleted target. So we are in the running for that. Either way, we get an additional um, uh, target model. So uh, bottom line here is that a generation three program is really rich physics with those detectors. And that's, I think, why you should invest in Xenon because uh, this is, it's a no brainer to me to build those experiments. Not only would we cover the WIMP prior down to the background from this, what is called the neutrino flow, the atmospheric neutrinos, but also we would have all kinds of other dark matter channels that I didn't really talk about, axions, uh, sterile neutrinos, Planck mass dark matter, super WIMPs. Ask me about any of those if you are interested. We would be ready for a galactic supernova. We would be able to measure boron-8 neutrinos and atmospheric neutrinos via coherent elastic nucleus scattering. We could measure PPSOL neutrinos and then either CNO neutrinos or neutrino double beta decay and look for double weak decay. So that's quite a, quite a rich, power, uh, uh, rich and powerful dark, uh, science program, particularly given the cost of a few tens of millions of dollars. So it's not really expensive. Um, and if you think that sounds all too good, here's something that sounds even better. Those experiments already today have an incredible capability. I have this massive target and if whatever process comes along and ejects just a single electron from any atomic shell, the single free electron will now find itself in this electric drift field and will drift up, I will extract it in the gas phase and I will see it. There's just no way around. This plot on the left is what a single, the signal that you get from a single 
the S2 signal, the ionization signal that you get from a single electron that has been extracted in the gas phase. It's whoppingly huge. It's 20 or 30 photoelectrons. You can't miss it. So that's really fantastic and it makes you wonder, you know, you have a massive target of tons of material and you see every single electron that have, has been liberated for whatever reason. Couldn't you, you know, use that signal? And the answer is, well, the signal is there, but the problem is every freaking process that uh, ejects just a single electron from any atom is a background in the process. So what I'm uh, happy to introduce to you is the Albeca collaboration, where we're looking at those backgrounds. Some of them are already in, uh, well understood, in particular shorter ones from photoionizations. These are not the worry um, some ones, just flash this here. Um, the backgrounds that we worry about are those that follow an interaction detector at timescales of hundreds of milliseconds because those can't be vetoed away. We had a discussion of, uh, we had a discussion about that earlier today as well. Um, um, so these are the backgrounds that need to be understood. You see that here, for example, on the left, this is a plot from Lux, where the maximum drift time would be 0.3 milliseconds, but you see after an event in the detector for hundreds of milliseconds here, so fractions of a second, you introduce some background. And the question is, what are those, what are those backgrounds? L some long-lived states in the xenon or delayed extraction, we're working on that. Uh, and can we, can we address them? Um, the Albeca collaboration is uh, bridging the gap between the Xenon collaboration and the LZ collaboration to address just that with a small team um, to um, test those backgrounds in multiple R&D setups and, uh, well, understand and ultimately reduce those backgrounds so that within a very short time with a very small detector, don't need a lot of target mass here, we can build something that is really made to do that. And so the promise is, okay, so the promise is that with a detector like this one, this is Adams here at LNNL, or this one on the left is the one that I have at Purdue, with a small detector like that, with a small target mass of a kilogram, you can actually become sensitive to a wide range of uh, signals. In particular, what I'm showing you here is the reach um, for lighter dark matter. So we're now going into hundreds of mega electron volts of dark matter. Um, this is a freezing scenario. It's also a thermal relic particle, if you like. Again, you see it's well defined. And what you can in principle do just by exposure, if you understand your backgrounds, which is of course the big if, you have uh, the promise of being able to cover many orders of magnitude of yet uncovered parameter space. And at the same time, because you have this low target, uh, we would expect in such a detector something like 10, well, s systematic uncertainty at this stage, uh, plus or minus five events per kilogram in year. So it's a large number above a background from, uh, from uh, solar boron eight neutrinos. So I think that's quite an exciting uh, project to work on. So the take home message here is that really what is happening in xenon, but also in a lot of other projects, and you have a liquid helium idea uh, right here at Brown, um, where, we, where we not only have uh, the promise of very fast and very creative new detectors with uh, fast and quick results, but also really what we're doing is we're bringing this discovery level science back to the universities. For those projects, we don't no longer need the large labs that you know have tens of million dollars, but uh, single or five PI uh, investigator grants at a university read one PhD thesis can really make an impact and do that. Okay, with that, um, let me conclude. Dark matter has been discovered. Um, liquid xenon TP has an incredibly rich science program, not just for WIMSO thermal relics, but for axion sterile neutrinos, a lot of solar neutrinos, astroparticle physics with neutrinos, even neutrinoless double beta decay. Uh, xenon 1 ton uh, is currently at the lead, but uh, we are, uh, with both xenon and ton and LZ, I think we're very well positioned to plow forward. Um, uh, we will need, a, I think, a generation three experiment to fully exploit the science capabilities of this technology. Um, but at the same time, while we build a bigger detector, work on that, I think there's also really a rich uh, promise and opportunities here for uh, uh, um, uh, discovery science back at the university labs. Thank you so much. I'm looking forward to your questions. Questions from the audience. Uh, thank you. It's a very pretty slide. At the beginning of your presentation, you mentioned that the local density of dark matter is about 0 0.3 GeV. Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering where that number comes from. And I, ha I was under the impression that that number comes with a large uncertainty mm -hmm. because you need some assumption about mm -hmm. how they like the earth the sound location yep uh, excellent question um, so the, the where the number comes from is you look at the rotation curve you measure this rather well how fast the stuff going around the galaxy and then you ask which component of that can you attribute to baryons that that we know so this goes back to the astronomers where you look at uh, um, surface uh, luminosity relations 
Um, this particular one here from 2011, you can see what they attribute to the various uh, contributions. And um, because it's an integral measurement, it's actually not so bad um, if you do it integral. Um, okay, so now, if, I, if, you, if you really want me to quantify it, and there is an astronomer that works on that in the audience that I'm sure to be hit, but I would for sure say that the uncertainty is less than 0.1 GeV, certainly. Um, we can argue at that level. Um, I think more importantly what, where this comes in is um, for, for my searches is actually not really relevant because um, uh, what we measure is a rate, right? And the rate is, uh, let's just go through, the, oops, uh, what, we, what we measure is a rate which goes like cross-section times the flux. And so really I'm just linearly dependent on the local density. So if you, you know, if the local density is an order of magnitude more or less, all that does is that means that the limits that I'm placing are an order of magnitude more or less strong. And again, we're on a log log plot, so you know, do I really care about an order of magnitude? Eh. Right, so, yeah. so uh, I have a couple of questions. Yeah, I have a couple of questions. If you go to slide 18. Mm -hmm. um, right, I think here for the coherent scattering, one should be careful that it is, well, it is the moment, transport the moment. That's correct. That's more, not yes. only the, 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 mom, the, <laughs> the prevalence of the particle itself. That's right? entirely correct, yep. Right, so, well, okay, so that means, so if, if they, the moment of transport is big enough, which means the wavelength is short enough, it can see the structure of the yes. nucleus. Yes. So, so it's not necessary to, to be always a coherent scattering. Yeah, so exactly. So let me comment on that first. Comment is entirely correct, um, and I, I realized it when I said it, right? What I said is uh, the wavelength of the particle, and it's actually, as a matter of fact, what I have here. That's just an approximation. What really matters, of course, if you write down the Feynman graph, right, is the transfer, the wave, the, 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 the transferred momentum and the wavelength of that. Yes. So the way we take that into account in reality is that we assume coherence and then take the decoherence into account with a form factor that we just multiply on the coherence rate, um, which, uh, yeah, I, I think that's, that's the answer to that. So yes, there is decoherence, which is taken into account with the form factor. Uh, thanks. Uh, my second question, if you go to the last part of your presentation, like uh, Le Lebraca, that, that, that project. Uh, so okay. yeah, my, co uh, my question is how, for that project, how you, I think it's H2 only. This so is H2 for, only, yes. Right, right. How you can discriminate uh, ER from NR and then before you can do that, it's very hard to convince others that you can do background for AOR. Right, okay, yeah, yeah. no, 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 absolutely you're right. I, I think I may, I, I hope I hinted at that when I said it. So the limit that you see here um, comes from a funding proposal where we, the question is so, so you, you ask, you build this new technology and you want to know what's the reach of it. And we're not the only ones building new technologies. You may have had talks or you uh, may, f may, may have had talks or you may, may be going to have talks about you, people using CCD cameras or uh, bubble chambers or different target materials or cryogenic detectors or liquid helium to do the same thing. And it becomes very, very difficult to discuss and really come down to the different technologies. So what you could do now is you could make the best background estimate that you can and lie to yourself that you understand your background, which I'm, I hope I made the point clear. We do not understand the background, which is exactly the point of the Albaca project. Um, so instead, what we did here, instead of doing any of those assumptions, we just said the thing that everybody can back of the envelope confirm, and that is this uh, limit is background free exposure, which we all know is not going to happen. So yes, this is overly optimistic, but what it does allow you very easily is to compare the different, the, the, the science, the physics behind the different uh, experiments, leaving aside the experimental tricks that you know, we need to play. At the same time, you can ask how, how much time should a graduate student invest into coming up with, the, I mean, what, what's the background? 10 events, 100 events, and per what time? When really, you, I just don't know, right? So I wanna put an, a reach without lying, and so I just tell you upfront, I don't know my background. If I had zero, and we both agree we're not going to have zero, that's where I would be. Multi-messenger astronomy is pretty exciting, and neutrinos are now playing a part in that yep. with the snow. I mean, not, I mean the uh, South Pole was yeah, absolutely uh, yeah. really exciting. Um, is there any chance that these underground detectors in the mines can do as well as the huge uh, ice cube uh, detectors? Absolutely. Um, so. 
First of all, multi-messenger astrophysics, when we talk to gravitational waves, their gravitational waves, don't, uh, they don't scale like one over R squared. So um, one question that I get often is, can we, if there's a gravitational wave, can we look for something coming from that? Yes, you can look for it, but gravitational waves come from megaparsec and one over R squared just kills that. Um, uh, neutrinos, cosmological neutrinos, for the same reason, we can look for that stuff totally, and we are doing it totally but you don't really expect much because there you are at high energies and we are at very low energies and one of R squared does is tricky. Where multi-messenger really, really comes in is for a galactic supernova. That's the channel that we currently have fully on. Um, because of the reason that was just mentioned, that is backgrounds that in the ionization only, at the S2 only channel, which is what you need to exploit here. Um, the only reason we are uh, sensitive with xenon one ton right now to a galactic supernova is actually by taking the multi-messenger approach, or in the, well, in this case, the neutrino messenger approach, we're getting a trigger from snooze and then look in real time at that data. And that's what we do here. So actually we're putting now forward a, a large consortium together with LC, Xenon, DarkSide, other experiments to really exploit that for a galactic supernova and be ready for that to give out a warning. I mean, you know the SNUS project um, to, with snooze to, to give out a, an alarm. The fun thing there is, if I just may spend another minute, the fun thing there is if you have a galactic supernova, any supernova, the neutrinos actually, they free stream out of the exploding star. Whereas photons, because it's so dense, they scatter. And so actually it turns out that the neutrinos will arrive at Earth before the photons do. So with, a, with taking a network of neutrino telescopes, and yes, that's one of them, uh, together you can actually predict that you are going to see the flash, the photon flash from a galactic supernova. So we're doing that. So would you have seen uh, 1987A? We would, uh, okay, 19, <laughs> 1978 is, uh, was a large Magellanic cloud, was it, I think? Yeah. Um, so yes, we would have seen it at two sigma. Yeah. So we would have seen a few events. Yeah, really, I think what you want for, for that is you want, again, the generation three experiment, which tells you that you have a very, very clear signal, or here, this is what this shows is the, the total neutrino flux amplitude, meaning how much energy, because this is flavor insensitive, how much energy colorimetrically went into neutrinos. And really what you want to do is you want to make a nice measurement of what you see with a, a generation three experiment. This is called Darwin here. Um, we will be able to do that very, very nicely. So before you leave this plot, what I'd like to see on, on the same scale is where does Ice Cube sit? Oh, oh, yeah, no, no, no. Um, so, so, uh, yeah, so Ice Cube, again, is uh, two orders of magnitude more expensive, and consequently, we'll see two orders of magnitude more neutrinos. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What threshold do you assume? Uh, this is... This is two electrons, I think. But here, what you have is you really have the... So what you have for this is you have the, the timestamp comes from the snooze network, so, and now you're just looking for a, uh, the supernova neutrino pulse, which is order of a second. There's afterglow, which goes 10 seconds, but really the neutrinization burst and, burst and all that uh, is, is less than a second. And so within that, you now just look at all events, uh, take out the high energy events, and what is left gives you that. But you're saying most of the signal is just in terms of single electron, double electron. That's right. So, you know, in Ice Cube, you have the same thing. In Ice Cube, uh, actually, the supernova, they have a special supernova trigger where they don't reconstruct tracks, but they just see an overall increase in noise rate in their detector, and they trigger for that and call that a supernova. Similarly, here, we would have an increase in the overall noise rate, which we probably couldn't pick up with Xenon 1 ton yet. Um, and so we take the trigger from Ice Cube and uh, Super K and other detectors, and then say, okay, so now what's, what's really, so, so that takes care of the, of the trial factor, right? And can you get any kind of timing resolution for triangulation, or is that, that's too that's literally a proposal that we're just as of now writing and will submit in four weeks from now. Yes, I think we can do that. Together with uh, Ice Cube, Super K, Dune, uh, again, LZ, uh, you, guys, you folks are on board, uh, Xenon, Darkseid. Oh, this is just uh, speed of light over the size of the Earth, right? So uh, it's actually not so bad. This issue of uh, 50 ton Darwin. Hmm. You raised this issue of 50 ton Darwin experiment. How much uh, technology, technological change do you imagine there's going to be over the current detectors? I mean, obviously, I realize you were pushed for time when you yeah. mentioned it, but are there particular things that you uh, think must change? 
Uh, right, so we actually, we just put together a small group again, bridging LZ and Xenon over the summer, you, you are well aware, uh, where we just discussed exactly that. You know, can I just drag and drop? This is what, what the picture that you see there is literally just somebody taking drag and drop of a technical drawing of uh, Xenon Wonton, and there you are. Um, that's not going to work in, in a few key features. I think uh, one of the main things is that right now, uh, there is uh, uh, volume between the outside of the TPC and the inside of the cryostat. The TPC, because it has a high voltage, um, needs to be insulated electrically from the cryostat, which is on ground. And uh, if you just scale it up the way we've always done it, um, because of you know, R square scaling, you would put in $10 million of xenon outside your TPC. I think that's the first thing that was not going to fly. We will need to hermetically seal the TPC itself so that outside the TPC we can either put vacuum or liquids, another cheaper liquid scintillator. Um, that's, that's one of the key things. Um, the, what's other things? Um, the uh, discrimination is key. Uh, we have the PP solar neutrinos giving you electronic recoils, and we need to be able to distinguish them sufficiently well from the nuclear recoils that we expect from the atmospheric neutrinos as well as from dark matter. And for that, as uh, your collaborators have shown, we need a very high light collection efficiency. So I think we'll need to work with Hamamatsu to get those 33, 35% uh, light collection efficiencies up and uh, maybe work on the um, on the uh, uh, coating of the Teflon or uh, dope. At this point, it's actually very unusual scintillators because it's pure xenon, which as far as uh, scintillators go, is very unusual. Usually you dope them with something to get the light yield up. We're just now starting to work at exactly that. Um, how can we get the light yield further up to improve the amplification? But all those things are, uh, I think at the level of a colloquium uh, or even at the seminar level, I would say, sure, right, there's R&D work to be done but I am not aware of any shows up whatsoever. I think actually the project is really straightforward to the point of being almost boring. There's stuff to do. It's very clearly acknowledged that there is important R&D work. Um, you know the notorious problem of putting high voltage at the fields. None of those experiments that I've shown you um, were able to put the design high voltage on the cathode. And nobody knows why. Um, we, we, came, we got by without actually doing that, um, but if you extrapolate for this experiment, you really need to find out why that is. But, you know, is that, is that a showstopper? Come on, I mean, you know, it's putting high voltage on a piece of wire. Um, you, you can play with that and try that out and, and find out what the problems were and then um, work around them. So I don't see, I don't see a showstopper. I see, see some interesting R&D, um, and I see a very rich science case at a very small price tag. Uh, not to make a joke, but from the time of uh, Xenon 10 until we have uh, Darwin, hmm. what's the price of Z what has the price of Xenon oh. gone from to what it is now and what it'll be? Yes. And how many private suppliers of Xenon are there if one wanted to invest in Xenon <laughs> as its company? So here's, here's the catch. Uh, xenon is not a traded commodity. You cannot buy Xenon shares because the market is so small. That's a big bummer because I would have bought into that market a long time ago. Um, because it is such a small market um, that has only a handful of suppliers and a handful of uh, uh, consumers worldwide that are at the big level, uh, it's an extremely volatile market. Um, y the price actually remains relatively stable. If anything, I would argue that it came down a bit. Um, that is because uh, a lot of, um, uh, like those lamps up there are probably xenon lamps. This is high intensity lighting industry. Completely, the market collapsed completely with the, uh, with the advances of LED lights. And so there is suddenly a huge uh, demand that broke completely away. Um, there is another big market, which is uh, on, the other, on the flip side, which is uh, um, uh, attitude control of satellites where they use uh, xenon bursters. Xenon you know, is just very heavy, so you know, momentum conservation, you, you like to put that out uh, to get your satellites where they need to be. That is ramping up on the converse side. Then there's the other one is uh, medical applications. It's an, um, it's an asphyxiant. It's a, um, um, uh, sorry, not an asphyxiant. It's a, yeah. uh, uh, anesthetics. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, that apparently has no, no known side effects. So that's uh, also something which, if it gets through the medical trials, will may take off. Um, so, so yeah, um, I'm, I'm not worried about that at all. And the reason is because, so, so Rick and his collaborators have at least 10 or 12 tons 
Uh, me and my collaborators, we have about the same amount. Uh, we put in the Japanese, which have another one or two tons, and I don't know what the Chinese do, so I'll leave that out. But so already there, we have 20, 25 tons of xenon already sitting in our detectors. Um, so we just need to you know, up that by a factor two. We just need to do, again, what we've already done in the past. Um, I really, again, I think it'll be interesting. It's not going to be trivial, right? It's not that you place one PO and you buy 20, half of the world year production of xenon. Uh, that's not going to fly. But if you spread that out over five years and you easily have that on the timescales that we are talking, uh, you buy 10, 20% of the world market every year. Uh, again, we've done that in the past. I don't see why we shouldn't be able to do that in the future. Um, does that answer your question? Uh, the, what, what did the, oh, uh, sorry, you, you asked what did the price do? The price is extremely volatile. It jumps up and down by at least a factor five, if not more, on order of magnitude. Ask, it, but has stayed roughly stable. How much is the xenon worth that will be in LZ, and how much is the xenon worth in uh, d the, uh, with, so the, the, the uncertainty on that, so the question is how, how much is it worth? How much, how much does Xenon cost? And that, that I'll, I'll give you a number, but that number comes, just to be aware that this number comes with an order of magnitude uncertainty in the price, depending on when you buy or sell it. Um, if we buy a large amount of Xenon, we just did that for Xenon one ton, immediately afterwards the world market price just jumped up by a factor of three just because we, made a, we placed a PO. Um, so the, the, the typical price tag that I think is, is good for you know, long-term average rigs say that tell me whether you disagree, I would put it at about uh, $1,000 per kilogram. So we're talking here about that we have already $20 million of xenon and we need another 20 million, so 30 million of xenon. Which again, you know, you divide it by five years, you divide it by a collaboration, which if we put together is three, 400 people, uh, you divide that by a dozen or so countries and meaning two dozen funding agencies, it's really not a lot of money. It's, it's quite cheap. Also remember, I mean, we're, we're in a position to buy when the market has yep. surpluses, especially if we're not under pressure and the agencies understand. Also, we've worked with private uh, private organizations to do that. And the other thing is, of course, it's not as if the price of the xenon changes. We don't consume it in the experiments. Yep. So working with private institutions, we can, in fact, warehouse the xenon through them a little bit, like the situation the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory had with the D2O. You can effectively put the, uh, the xenon price outside of the project if you want, and uh, simply sell the, you know, they take the xenon back at the end of the experiment. So it's, it's, it's not like argon, for instance, where you have to invest the vast majority of the money with argon comes in what you do with it afterwards. The stuff is dirt cheap, being 1% or 0.9% of the atmosphere as opposed to one part in 10 million, which is what the xenon is, but uh, all, the, all the cost of argon is in what you do to it subsequently because you have to separate all the argon 39, which is a huge radioactive burden out of it. The xenon we get is the xenon we use apart from removing some of the electronegative impurities. So, um, it, 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 uh, and krypton, I suppose. Right. right. Uh, yes, yeah, sorry. Yes, to be fair, we, we take, sorry, see, krypton is one part in one million of air, mm. uh, and the way that we tend to bring it out, right now the way that you bring xenon out of the air, you end up with some residual krypton levels at the PPD level, and you'd like to be PPQ, so uh, that does require um, a little bit of work. <laughs> but those, this infrastructure already exists and can be reused, so I'm perfectly happy to rent the xenon from you. Satellites uh, propulsion systems are going to be eating this stuff. So yeah, it's um, we'll, we'll be on this. We'll have no problem selling it if we run out of things to do with it. Okay, I, I think we have a second speaker. Get that. Thank you.